Manchester Metropolitan University and part of the team that has written the resources for making sense of maths. I was one of the first teachers to use these kinds of resources in the classroom a good few years ago when we trialled the Maths in Context series of resources, which is an American version of these resources at Key Stage 3. So I'm going to talk you today through this chapter. When we did the trial with teachers, we, did a, we gave a lot of CPD, so this is our way of trying to do that with you on the VLE. And these books have been trialled with some schools in Greater Manchester working with foundation students at Key Stage 4. So the first book is Models and Measures. In these series there's a pupils book and there's a pupils workbook and what we do recommend is that you print a copy off of each for yourself just to give you a bit of an overview of the resources. They're unlike traditional textbooks, it's quite hard to flick through them and see what they're about and what we found when working with teachers is that we really do recommend they had to work through the books because you can't tell at a glance what the topics always are. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to walk through this section A of this first book with you and by doing that illustrate some of the general features of working in this way. So the first question is draw a sketch of the queue showing the position of Aisha. Aisha has number 743. Now what I'd like you to do is actually have a go at that yourself. When we've asked pupils to do this, they have drawn a sketch with varying degrees of detail. Sometimes, you know, there are stick people. Sometimes they've got themselves in the queue. And I think a natural reaction when you're faced with a question like this is almost to think, why am I doing this? What's the point in doing this? And you've just got to kind of go with that initially. So you'll get various versions of the queue. Sometimes the queue's snaking, sometimes it is just in a line. And what you've got here is a photograph, and these are used a lot, which illustrates a context which then becomes a mathematical model. You'll see down the bottom of the page. This Q becomes a number line further down the page. And the pupils are much more familiar with the text lingo there than we are. And what we're working towards here is using the number line model for subtraction. Now this is a model which students age 15 resist in my experience. They think it's babyish to be going back to this model. And maybe just for you to be aware of that, is worthwhile, but it's definitely a model that they do find helpful if they can get over that resistance to it. Actually, the context here is historical events, and they are more familiar with that and the idea of a timeline. So although it again becomes a number line, it's in the context of a timeline, and they are more used to doing that. And I think what you do here is really see the power of this model. For example, if you're putting on the world's first MP3 player in 1998, and you're comparing that with the first iPod in 2001, you know, if students were just to try and subtract those numbers in the traditional way, there'd be loads of borrowing involved. It'd be very complicated. Whereas actually when you see the linear relationship between those two numbers, the adding on model, starting at the lower number counting up, is a much more natural thing to do. And this really is the power of the number line for these students who often, even at age 15, find that vertical algorithm very tricky. And so there's a little bit of practice here with that idea of jumping up on the number line from the lower number up to the higher number and they have to make their own history line with their own important events quite enjoy doing that and then one of the features of these materials is very much to focus on student strategies and the various student strategies and the next couple of questions are forcing that issue so we've got Carrie saying this is how I do it and you then have to describe Carrie's approach and then you've got Julius doing it a different way and Mario making another suggestion. My experience of working with these materials is that often they make suggestions that I've not thought of either. It seems so obvious to me now that you might go 1960 to 1977, you know, jump up the two either way. But I don't think I would naturally have thought of that myself. There are worksheets that go with the books and what we have found in the past is it's really helpful if you have printed off an individual booklet for each student of the worksheets. Now there are some pages in colour, that's not always necessary, sometimes it is really helpful the colour, but it is, it's easier than keep handing out a sheet each lesson for them to do. And the emphasis here is to practice the jumping up on the number line model for subtraction, but also to compare how that's done, effective strategies one person and another. So that's why the question asks them, what did you do in the same way, what did you do differently? 
currently. This is interesting. In a maths lesson, you've often seen problems like this, 826 minus 489. Work out this problem in your notebook. What we find students doing is going back to the vertical algorithm and often making mistakes with that. For example, 6 to take away 9, well, that's 3. So that's an interesting question because I think that will be around in the classroom. They do try to do the vertical algorithm, and some of them are successful in that. There may be other ways around. It'd be interesting also to see, do they now, having had this experience of the number line, use that? Probably not. How can you be sure your answer is correct? This is something that is around a lot in these books, trying to get students to have that certainty about their answer. You know, is their answer just based on a procedure? And often if it is, then the procedure is something remembered and it doesn't give them much certainty about whether the answer is correct. Or is this if they got something they can dig a bit deeper or they can see it to make sure, give them a bit of certainty about how correct they are. So here we have their... This question is about marrying their natural approach now to a question like that, which may well be based on a procedure, with this model that's been offered of the number line. And even those students that were resisting the number line now, what we're trying to get them to do is, yes, you can still have the method you like, prefer, but can you see your method alongside the number line? You know, what are the similarities and differences? And that might be something as a teacher you would want to get them to work on. Where can they see this 6 minus 9 borrowing from the 20? Where can they see that happening on the number line? And that, that where can you see question from one minute to another is often a difficult thing to be answering. So we're still here working on this number line, encouraging students to think in that way. Question 12, more practice, show your work. Now it may be that some students here are starting to say, well I don't need to draw this number line, I'm imagining it in my head. And I think that's okay. You know, if they're starting to say, right, 3,000 minus 1,998, well, actually, I'm just going to do 3,002 minus 2,000. I think that's quite powerful if they get to that stage. Questions 13 and 14. Again, I think this is for you to be able to do some finding out about how they naturally approach addition of this type. Do they go for that vertical algorithm? Or are they thinking here in 14a, oh, I'll add the 50, the 10, and the 20? and then add my units. And again, if you see in question 13 there, be prepared to explain your calculations. Again, this relates to the certainty of what they've done. How do they know they're right?